Okay, I'm going to talk about something near and dear to my heart since I in charge of the insurance programs, and that's board member liabilities. <clears throat> any, any questions about the, the boring tax stuff? I just want to spend some time on that because it's important stuff for you to know, and it, it, a lot of people are confused about the property tax system in the state. Okay. Um, the Oregon Tort Claims Act. There's a statute in Oregon law that governs the liabilities of public officials. Everyone in this room is a public official, except you insurance agents, <laughs> and you are subject to the Oregon Tort Claims Act. Okay? The Oregon Tort Claims Act says that every public official is subject to the actions for suit of its torts and those of its officers, employees, and agents acting within the course and scope of their duties. What does that mean? In plain English, that means that your district is responsible for your torts. Okay, if you get sued individually, your district has to defend and indemnify you for your actions as a board member under Oregon law if you're acting within the course and scope of your duties. As long as you're acting as a board member in the course and scope of your duties, doing what you're supposed to and authorized to do what you're under law, the district has to defend and indemnify you. You cannot have personal liability. However, public officials can now be named in lawsuits individually. So that creates kind of a complicated situation <clears throat> because you can actually be named now. You'll, you can see your name and often will see your name if your district gets sued on a lawsuit. But don't panic. Don't get up and run out of the room and resign, okay? <laughs> Which some of you probably want to because up here still goes. So you can be named but the, your district has to indemnify and defend you. And if they have insurance, which I hope they do, and most everybody does through S, um, SDAO, w SDAO is going to have to come in and defend and indemnify you and the district. Okay. So who's covered under that? Who, who's going to have to be indemnified and defended? Um, the board of directors, the employees, volunteers, um, agents, not insurance agents, but people that you, are, um, you have control over, uh, boards and commissions that you have control over, and under your coverage here, anybody you've entered into a contract to name them as additional insured. That's not something that's in the Tort Claims Act, but that's something that we're, we'll talk about what that means in a minute. So, um, who's covered? Got some examples here. And these are uh, trick questions, some of these, but I'm going to ask you for answers. Employees accused of sexual assault of a minor. Is that person going to be covered? No. Well, uh, a lot of these are going to be maybes is the answer. Okay? <laughs> we don't know that that, until that person is found guilty, we don't know, right? So a lot of times, you're still going to have to a lot of times defend somebody up to a certain point. Um, if they're found guilty, of course, they're going to be on their own. But there is a certain point where you're probably going to have to provide them some defense while you're going through an investigation to, to determine if they were acting outside the course and scope of their duties. Once you determine that, then you can cut them loose. Does it matter if they're on the job or not? Yes. I mean, if is, they have to be acting as, if they're an employee, they've got to be there acting as an employee. If they're at home, no. Um, so a board meeting, at a board meeting, a board member says another board member is a thief and overcharges clients at his business, and uh, the person that's accused sues him for slander and defamation. Is that board member covered? Yeah, there we go. Another trick question. The reason is because there's some immunity when you're at a board meeting. Okay, you can be nasty to each other at board meetings, unfortunately, and some of you do, aren't it? Um, we get those <laughs> situations all the time, but you can defame each other when you're at a public meeting like that and there's really no recourse. Now, you step outside that meeting and you do that, you're on your own. You're not acting in the course and scope, you're not a board member, and you can be sued individually and you're not going to be covered by the district. You can intentionally say something you know is untrue to another board member at a board meeting? Pretty much, yeah. There's, it's, it's, it goes all the way, you know, you've... <laughs> Goes U.S. Constitution type stuff. I mean, yeah. The reason I ask is it came up once years ago, and I got in touch with the Attorney General through a long type of deal. 
Yeah. And it ended up that he told me that basically you couldn't say that the people that weren't covered were the people that were there. They were some uh, environmentalists, and they were spouting outrageous stuff. Well, if they're, they're they can say whatever they want, he said. Mm-hmm. But as a board member, he said you have to tell the truth. Now you tell me that's not true. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, I know yeah. what I should do, but there, I'm saying what I should do and what other people right. do. Right. There's always caveats to everything, but as far as you know, our attorneys are concerned, when we get these types of things, it's very hard to say that, to cut somebody loose if they've made comments during a public meeting. So. Not that any of our board members have ever done No, I'm sure no, none of you have ever experienced that, I'm sure. Um, okay, a juvenile is participating in a park district event and he assaults and seriously injures another kid. Is that kid that assaulted that kid gonna be covered because it was a park district activity. No, right? They're not a board member. They're not an employee. They're not an agent. They're not a volunteer. Huh? And you know that park district's going to be sued because they're going to say, I'm, they didn't have the supervision and every other thing. You're exactly right. And the park district's going to be covered, okay, for that liability, but that kid's not. Um, volunteer firefighter accused of medical malpractice when administering first aid. Is that person going to be covered? Yes. Yes. Okay, because they're a volunteer. Volunteers are covered. Board member attends a Chamber of Commerce event that is on cable TV, says he's there on behalf of the district, and then accuses the chamber members of embezzlement. Okay, these are all true stories, by the way. Um, so anyway, is, is that person going to be covered? He says he's there representing the district. Very good, but... In this case, let's say he didn't. He just says, I'm a board member, so I'm a, f- you know, because I'm a board member, I'm gonna go wherever I want, and I'm gonna say that I'm here on behalf of the board, and I'm a board member of XYZ, and I'm representing the district. No way, okay? He's outside the course and scope. If the rest of the board didn't say, you know what, you're our representative for the Chamber of Commerce, and we think the Chamber of Commerce, some misdealings are going on, and we want you to go there and address this, then th- he's gonna be covered. But if he just goes there and says, I'm a board member for the district and I'm accusing you of this, no, I'd get sued for slander, defamation, that board member's on their own. You know, a good example, we had a, a district, a port district, where a board member had um, really disliked the manager and some of the staff, and she put up a blog on the internet, you know, where every day she would just put all this slanderous stuff on there, and she got sued by the port manager. And, of course, she filed a claim with us and said, well, you know, I'm, I'm protected. I'm a board member. And we said, you know, met with her and her husband and said, no, you're not. You should, who on the board asked you to do this? You're on your own. And her husband made her take it down the next day. Thank um, what, what about when everybody on our board has certain responsibilities to go to, let's say, the Chamber of Commerce? Are, by that, just giving them that, granting them that, they're the representative that goes to the we never specifically tell them what to say or mm-hmm. whatever. Yeah, they're pro- you know, it's going to be a gray area. If, um, if they came back and, and the rest of the board disavowed everything that they said and said that's absolutely unacceptable, then the, it could be that they wouldn't have coverage. But it's, it's going to be a real gray area as far as defending that. Um, this goes under this additional insured stuff I was talking about. One thing is, you all know what that is, Danny? That's when you sign a contract. Most of you see those when you, people want, you want to rent somebody's facility or, and they say, well, okay, you can do that, but we're going to need you to be, um, name us as an additional insured on your policy. And you always just say yes and sign it without reading it, right? And they say, you're going to indemnify and hold them harmless for everything on earth, no matter what. Unfortunately, people do sign those. Um, well, one thing that's important is you're only going to be covered for those, you're not going to be able to cover somebody for their sole negligence, okay? Only if you have negligence. So here's an example. District landlord is sued, district's landlord is sued because someone is injured tripping over the district's extension cord, and the district has a contract with the landlord agreeing to name them as additional insured. So the district's renting a building. They've agreed under a contract with the landlord to name the landlord as additional insured for any negligence that they create and somebody trips over the district's extension cord, is the district going to have coverage for that? Yes, they are. 
But here's another example. District's landlord sued because someone is injured tripping over a broken curb that's the sole responsibility of the landlord. It's outside the building, has nothing to do with the lease. District has a contract landlord agreeing to name this additional insured for any and all liabilities. Okay, is the district gonna have coverage for that? Most likely district's not gonna have coverage for that. They're gonna be stuck with it because they've agreed to that under contract, but they're not gonna have any insurance coverage for that because the insurance says that we're not gonna let you take on someone's sole liability. That was the sole liability of that landlord. Okay, some government immunities that you have under the Oregon Tort Claims Act. There are some certain special things that basically say that as public officials, you and your districts have complete immunity for. The most important being discretionary immunity. The, re the rationale behind discretionary immunity and what that means and why it was created was that obviously as government entities, you have limited funds. You can't do everything on earth. You have immense responsibility and limited dollars. So there's a ton of things that can go wrong in your, with what you do that people can sue you for. This, will give, this gives you some immunity if you've put on record that you know you have a problem, you have a plan to address that problem, and you don't have enough money right now to do it, but you have an action plan in place. Okay? Um, a good example, I'll give you some examples in a minute. And recreational immunity, that was created to, to allow people to have others come onto their lands and recreate and not have liability for allowing those people. It's to encourage um, people to share their lands with, with the general public. And so you have immunity for that. So I have some examples here. Pork District is charging $1 for a boat ramp that has a, a man tripping a pothole breaking his leg. So it's a recreational activity, potentially recreational immunity. Um, they're providing this boat ramp to the public. Do you think they'd have immunity for that? Yeah. No, why, why not? Because they're charging. Absolutely. Because they charge that $1, the immunity goes out the door. If they didn't charge anything and it was just open to the public, they have immunity for that. So that's one thing to consider when you're figuring out, you know, is it worth the charge and make, um, you know, 50 bucks a year for something and waive your immunity? Or maybe you just decide to make it a free service and not collect that. That's the kind of business decision that you need to make. A canal that an irrigation district knew was in disrepair failed, flooding five houses. Maintenance supervisor elected not to fix it because of a budget shortfall. Now this is where I was talking about discretionary immunity. Discretionary immunity means, let's say the district knew that there's a problem with their canal, but they've got 100 miles of canal and it's all built back in the depression era, and there's no way, you know, they've got a $100,000 a year budget, there's no way they can maintain all that canal. But the board members have drawn up a maintenance plan where they say, you know what, we're gonna try to fix 10 miles a year um, over the next 20 years, and we're gonna allocate $10,000 a year to this. They have a plan. If that canal fails, they can use discretionary immunity as a defense for that liability but it has to be at a policy level decision. So in this example here, the maintenance supervisor elected not to fix it because of a budget shortfall. No discretionary immunity, okay? That's not a board decision, that's an employee making a decision. So that's why it's really important when you know you have problems, address it with the board. Put it on record, put an action plan in place. Yeah, you might not be able to deal with it, but figure out what you're gonna do in the future and get it on record. If you do that, it goes a huge way in protecting yourselves. Okay, a district adopts a five-year engine replacement plan because the trucks, uh, with many problems, at a fire, one of the pumps fails because the age of the truck and the district sued for not replacing the equipment sooner. In that case, the board had come up with a plan, right, for replacing those trucks. They're gonna be able to invoke discretionary immunity. Okay, here's kind of a, this is an actual case, City, city County Insurance Services, um, Woodburn, City of Woodburn, girl swinging um, at a park. The swing broke, causing the girl to break multiple bones. Parents sued the district for lack of maintenance. 
Think that was discretionary immunity? I wouldn't have thought so either, but the court said it is and they pl when they used that as an argument. And the reason was the city knew that its park was in disrepair. It did have a plan on replacing that, equip that play equipment. It just hadn't got there yet to doing it. Yeah, yeah, if they didn't have a plan, then they probably wouldn't have been able to use that as a defense. Um, no, you don't have to publicize it. You know, one thing, a lot of you probably, our loss control people go out from our insurance programs and they give you recommendations. They'll maybe, they'll give you a report that has pictures and recommendations of things that you need to fix at your district. <clears throat> make sure that those reports make it all the way up to the board. You know, make sure that the, the maintenance person that that report is going to, that went out with our staff, isn't just putting it, putting it on his bulletin board. Because then, not only have you not going to be able to use discretionary immunity, you've we've helped you create additional liability for yourselves. Because now you're on notice that you know it's a problem and you haven't done anything about it. But if that report makes it all the way up to the board and the board says, wow, looks like we've got some problems here we need to fix, and let's put a plan together about what we're going to do about this, you know, then you've, you've taken care of a lot of the problem. Okay, another thing in the Oregon Tort Claims Act is you, there do, are limits on what people can sue you for, statutory limits. So for bodily injury, they can only sue you for $566,000 per occurrence rising out of any single accident, and for all claimants combined, $1,333,300. Uh, that does escalate and eventually caps out at these amounts. So what that means is in this horrible situation here, this isn't real, a real accident we had, but in this situation, if you had 10 kids on this bus that were all um, severely injured or some killed or whatever, the maximum amount of liability for the school district in this case would be 1,133,000 for everyone combined. So the maximum amount per kid would be 566, but it, then it caps out for everybody combined at that amount. I'll tell you why that there's now the, the, those caps though are under some question. For uh, property damage, there's even lower caps on that. If a dam fails, if you're an irrigation district and you wipe out uh, an entire city, your maximum amount for all that property damage is $100,000 per claimant, $500,000 for all claimants combined. Now if that happens, eh, tort caps will go out the window, right? It'll be rebellion and lawsuits and which is what happened under, I'll tell you about next, Clark versus OHSU. Um, the caps used to be even lower. They used to be $200,000 uh, per claimant and $500,000 for everybody combined. That was the maximum you could get sued for. Um, Oregon Health Sciences University had a severe medical malpractice claim where uh, under a doctor's negligence, the uh, child was, went in for a fairly routine procedure the anesthesia was administered incorrectly. He ended up brain de dead, and um, the family sued for uh, $20 million. Uh, we think that OHSU did a, a bad thing, which was to just draw a hard line and say, no, our doctor is a public official, and we shouldn't pay a dime more than 200000 because, like I said with the dam, that's what happens. The legislature, the voters, they don't like, they don't like that when that kind of egregious situation. So that went all the way to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, no, that's not an adequate remedy under the Oregon Constitution. But you have to provide somebody with an adequate remedy. There's no definition in that Supreme Court decision about what an adequate remedy is, and that's why it's kind of in flux. So the legislature increased the caps, hoping that gets closer to an adequate remedy, but now still, every lawsuit that we get the attorneys are all claiming, oh, this is a Clark situation. Uh, the tort caps aren't adequate, and we're going to appeal this to the Court of Appeals saying that the tort caps aren't adequate and that it needs to be a higher limit to be a higher remedy. What that's leading to is a lot more lawsuits, frankly, against public agencies because the attorneys are seeing that there's more money to get out there now. Um, and another thing, too, that's because of Clark, that's why individuals can now, individual board members can be named in lawsuits. Before that, it was actually in the law, you could not be named. Now you can be named, but again, don't panic because what? What do we have to do? What does your district have to do? 
defend you, indemnify you. Okay? Well, the, what Clark said, the, reason, the whole reasoning, convoluted reasoning, the Supreme Court said that a public agency has sovereign immunity going back all the way to the laws of the kings and queens of England. So the public agency has, can have immunity, sovereign immunity, um, and the caps apply to the public agency still. There's no question. But individuals don't have sovereign immunity. So individuals have liability. And so because of that, it's like this loophole saying, okay, the, the district, it's, if the district itself is only named on the lawsuit and that's it, those caps cannot be breached, period. But if you add an individual to that and say, well, it's also the board's fault because the board authorized this and it's the manager's fault because the manager should have been supervising better, now that liability falls to those individuals and that's how you get above around the cap. Yeah. Let's play it a little different around. <clears throat> Private pond, a dam, a dam roof washes off the road. That's the district going against the private landowner for repair? Right. Yeah, if they wash out your road, then you would sue that landowner. They don't have any kind of immunities whatsoever. That would be the district suing the how that would how that would usually turn out if if it's something that's insured, then your insurance company would pay you for the damage, and then the insurance company would sub called subrogate or sue that property owner on your behalf to get the money. <clears throat>